All right, let's open our Bibles, if you have a Bible this morning, to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 1. If you'd like to stand with us as we read our text, Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number 1, we'll begin in verse number 6. Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 6. going to preach something very familiar to all of us, but I like one story that I heard of uh, years ago at D.L. Moody's church. They had an old preacher there, and he preached every night of the revival meeting. He preached John 3.16. Of course, everybody knows that familiar verse, and so uh, consequently, even years after that, any time D.L. Moody or anybody else would preach on John 3.16, the whole congregation would smile because they just remember that time when they had that meeting and the preacher hammered that verse for every single message. And then he made the comment, Moody made the comment, he said, don't discredit a text just because you're familiar with it. And so when I preach along these lines of the gospel and things that you may already know in your head, don't discredit it just because you're familiar with it. Uh, some of these things we need to be reminded of. There may be some folks in here that need to be taught some things as well. So let's see what the Lord might have for us from a very familiar uh, subject and theme this morning. Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Joe Garrison, pray for us, please. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Let me ask you a series of questions here as we get started. Do you think that every church is the same? Do you think that every church preaches and practices and teaches the same things? Or is it possible some churches and religions and preachers are preaching wrong? So these are questions that kind of start our thinking along this line. I want to preach on the subject here of false gospels. Paul mentions here in Galatians chapter 6, I marvel that you've been removed from the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he mentions this, these false gospels that come in. There's a similar passage in 1 Corinthians, we won't turn to it, but he says in 1 Corinthians, if someone comes and preaches another Jesus, you might bear with him. He was really rebuking those Corinthians. He says, you are so messed up that if somebody started preaching another Jesus, you'd listen to the guy. And do I need to say there are a lot of people in this country and in this world so messed up that they will sit, sometimes by the thousands, and listen to someone preach a false gospel with a false Jesus. Just like somebody's telling you the truth. And so I want to preach along these lines a little bit. I'm glad that there's been some people back in the past. There's been preachers that did have integrity in the past. Church members that had integrity in the past. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm glad that we don't have to look at church history and say everybody's a charlatan. Everybody's a fraud. Everybody's a fake. However, there sure are a lot of them today. Uh, I was reminded of a story years ago. I mentioned D.L. Moody. He was a great preacher of yesteryear. He had the big campaigns, the big, kind of like the Billy Graham stuff back before the days of Billy Graham. And he would have big revival meetings, and he had a song leader named Ira Sankey, and he had a musician that traveled with him quite a bit as well named P.P. P. Bliss, Philip Bliss. You'll see his name under the titles of many of your hymns in the hymn book. If you're familiar with the song, It Is Well With My Soul, 
he authored the music to that song. He wasn't the author of the actual words, but he was the musician for that song. Well, after that song became very, very popular back in the day, he was set to receive royalties. And, you know, you write something, you publish something, you get paid for that. He was going to get back in that day $60,000 royalties for the music, not just for it as well, but for all of his hymns for that year. He, he wrote a lot of hymns as well. And he brought all the $60,000 to D.L. Moody to the revival meeting and put it down and said, here you go. D.L. Moody said, you going to keep any for yourself? He says, no, every cent of it belongs to God. I doubt you would find these guys that have the expensive cufflinks and have the Mercedes and have a plane and have all this other stuff like you see on the TV preacher. I doubt you'd find somebody like that doing that today. But thank God there's some people in the past that preached the true gospel and realized this thing ain't about money. We're not after your money. We're after your soul. We're here for the real thing. We're, this is not some deal that we're trying to pad and trying to cushion ourselves and trying to promote ourselves. I know there's a lot of garbage going on. I know there's a lot of false gospels, but thank God the Bible still teaches the truth. Amen. And you can trust the Bible. Amen. And so I want to preach a little bit along the lines of false gospels. Now, I want to forewarn you here, I'm not going to be uh, all apologetic and polemic. In other words, we're not going to get up here and start breaking down the other religions and try to give you a breakdown on what everybody believes. You don't need to know what everybody believes. You need to know the truth. And if you know the truth, you can spot a counterfeit. Doesn't take very long to realize that guy, what he's saying doesn't ring right. There's something, maybe he's not using the right Bible. Maybe he's not. There's something he's saying that doesn't sound right if you know the truth. And so I want to kind of focus on that just a little bit. There's a lot of damage being done and destruction being done by the false gospels that's put out. Now the word gospel, it comes from the word back in the Old Testament, glad tidings. And so you see it translated over in the New Testament as gospel. When you break down the actual English word, it's God and spell. The words of God. And when we read the New Testament, obviously we find different gospels. Jesus Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom and that had to do with a political gospel where Jesus Christ would rule and reign as king of kings on the throne of David. We understand that. And of course that Jewish gospel had with it the accompanying signs, wonders, and miracles. The disciples were able to heal people. They were able to raise people from the dead. And they did those signs, wonders, and miracles because that was part of that gospel because of the signs for the Jewish nation. We see that extended out throughout the book of Acts because God was still trying to deal with the Jewish people so the apostles still had those powers to not only raise people from the dead, do miraculous healings, but even the gift of, you've heard a lot about I'm sure in different churches, speaking in tongues, which in the Bible speaking in tongues was always speaking in a foreign language, not just in some type of gibberish that's a different quote-unquote tongue. It was an actual different language. And that accompanied those ministry of God trying to deal with the Jewish people. That's why you see that. So you see a difference, obviously, in the gospel of the kingdom. And then we also know in the future, the Bible speaks of, in the book of Revelation, the everlasting gospel. And that everlasting gospel is preached in Revelation chapter 11 by an angel. And it's interesting, when you read Galatians chapter 1, Paul makes mention, if an angel preaches any other gospel than we've preached, let that angel be accursed, either the angel or the man or whoever. And it's interesting, in Revelation 14, there's an angel that's preaching a gospel, and the gospel does not match what Paul preached. So then you're faced with this supposed contradiction. You say, well, how does that make sense? It's kind of like this. You have a puzzle, and if you're like me, I don't have a lot of patience. If it kind of looks like it's supposed to go there, I try to make it go there. And it's amazing what you can do if you beat on those pieces for a while. And I can kind of get them to fit. Or you just rip the edges off a little bit, you know. Sometimes they have them little things that come on the end. Those things get in the way. Just peel them off and stick it there. Uh, but see, God's Bible and God's truth is like the pieces of a puzzle. If you don't put everything in the right place, it doesn't fit. The everlasting gospel that's preached out in the great tribulation period is not the same gospel that's preached today. Therefore, that angel is not cursed because that angel is sent by God. There's no contradiction. 
you have different things that go in different places. If I was to open up your mail out of your mailbox and start reading it and trying to take your checks that were sent to you and go to the bank and cash them in, it's not going to work because it's not delivered to me. You understand the difference? So we have some different Gospels, obviously, in the Bible that's pretty clear. Paul makes a distinction between the Gospel that he preaches because God gave Paul special revelation regarding the return of Jesus Christ. And he calls that his Gospel. But we also, and what I really want to go with this is what the Bible calls the Gospel. And you see it in verse number 6. The grace. You see that word grace? The Gospel of the grace of God. And that's what we see preached in what we call the New Testament dispensation, in the New Testament church. We are preaching the good news that God's grace to forgive you of all your trespasses, to save you from hell, is available if you'll take it. The good news that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, He was buried and He rose again from the dead the third day. And if you will trust Christ, just like Kylie did this morning before church, she received Christ as her personal Savior. Based on the authority of the Bible, she trusted Him. He's already done all the work. Now she has everlasting life. That's the gospel of grace. There's nothing that she's done. It's nothing that we've done to earn that grace. The Bible calls it also a gift. You know, the wages of sin is death. We die because of sin. But the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't you like getting gifts? We're getting close to Christmas, man. I like Christmas. Just like around my birthday. I celebrated my birthday last week, and I get all my birthday cards, and I put them on the mantle. I leave them up there for I like them. I, you say, well, you gave me a birthday card. What did you do with it? I took it, and I put it on the mantle. And it's still there. And I appreciate that. I like Christmas. I like to get gifts. Who doesn't? I'm just a big, I'm just a big kid. The more gifts, the better. You know, it's just fun. But it'd be pretty bad come January if you got a bill in the mail for those gifts. <laughs> it's kind of like parents, you know, the kid turns 16, they say, let's go down to the dealership. Pick out any car you want to make. You know, they pick out their car, they sign for it, co-sign for it, and then they got to make the payments. <laughs> what kind of deal is that? <laughs> well, there's no gift. But see, the gift of God is God's grace. Jesus Christ lived the sinless life you couldn't live. So his righteousness is given to you if you'll take it. So when he died on Calvary's cross, he paid the penalty for all of your sins, and God punished Jesus where he should have punished you. So instead of you having to go to hell and pay for your sins, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. And God's grace is if you want forgiveness, if you want to be forgiven, just take it. Jesus Christ as your payment. That's the gospel of the grace of God. I'll illustrate it this way as far as false gospels. The problem is, if you were just, let's just suppose you didn't have the background you have, let's just suppose you haven't been in church and so forth, and you just were interested in Christianity, and what do you do? You start Googling it, or you start asking Siri or all these other women, Alexa or whoever else, you know, tell me about the Christianity. What is Christianity? You're going to get all kind of things. Well, it's on the Internet. It must be true. Wikipedia said it, so it must be true. You're going to get all kind of things. Picture it like this. There was this, uh, this church group, and they had gotten together, and they had all these young people, and they wanted to illustrate a point. So they had one volunteer, and they took the volunteer into a room. They blindfolded him, and they got, they got another person. And they said, look, we're going to bring everybody in the room, and we're going to give you this vital, these vital instructions for this one person. The only way for them is a life and death situation. And you've got to communicate. You can't touch them. They're blindfolded. You, you can wave, but they're not going to see you. So you've got to communicate this life and death information to this one individual. Kind of lead them out, tell them how to get out of the room or whatever. Well, unbeknownst to those two people, of course, the one blindfolded, all they knew is you're going to go in this room and you're going to be given instructions so you can get out of here. And unbeknownst to those two people, the rest of the whole group, they told them, when you get that person in the room, I want you to start giving instructions at the top of your lungs. You know, tell them, try to get them to do what you want them to do. If you want them to go over to this particular chair and pick up the chair, and tell them to go pick up the chair. If you want them to go out the room, tell them. 
So here comes the person. He walks in with the blindfold, and immediately voices just screaming from every direction. They're in the middle of the plethora of voices all around them. You have all these people telling this person blindfolded what to do, but out of that whole group, there's only one person that had been given the specific instructions, the life and death instructions for that person. And they did that to illustrate a point. Here someone comes into this world, and they're lost without God. You're not born saved, by the way. You're born depraved. You're born with a sin nature. We want to do bad. Little kids, you know what? They want to eat the cookies before supper, right? I mean, good night. Who wants to eat, you know? Here's one thing we like to do as adults when we eat. A lot of times we say, I'm not going to eat seconds so I can save room for dessert, right? Here's a good plan. Just have dessert first. Then you can use up all the room for the dessert. Um, but little kids, very early on, they're going to try to find out how they can manipulate mom against dad. They're going to ask dad. If he doesn't say yes, they'll go ask mom. Or they will try and out how to blame it on the sister or blame it on the brother. The man is born. We are born bad. You say, well, it's the environment, you know. They were raised in a bad home or whatever. Okay, Adam and Eve were in a perfect environment. No problems. Garden of Eden. They messed up. The problem is not in the environment. The problem is you. The problem is me. We're born sinners. You're born depraved. So when you look at this situation, you come in, you're blindfolded. You don't know. You're not born saved. You don't, you're not born with the truth. And all of a sudden, you're stuck in a situation where all these people are screaming. All the Buddhists are telling you one thing. The, the, uh, the Muslims are telling you another thing. The Catholics are telling you another thing. The uh, atheists are telling you one thing. The uh, agnostics are telling you another thing. The scientists and, and uh, philosophers are telling you another thing. The other religions are telling you all these voices. People are like, who knows what to believe? You can interpret the Bible any way you want to interpret. There's so many interpretations. You can't be dogmatic about it. Everybody's got all kind of beliefs. Who knows? And people are frustrated because they're blinded and they're hearing so many voices. You know, one great thing about the Great Awakenings, first and second, if you know anything about church history, is even though you had some of the churches with different varying beliefs, obviously, they would many times come together regarding salvation. They would preach hell hot and heaven sure. They'd preach Jesus Christ the only way. But that has been diffused and dissipated in what we call evangelical Christianity today. Verse number 7, notice a false gospel distorts the gospel. It's like all these different voices, partial truths. There are people that use the name of Jesus Christ. There's a certain religion out in Utah that bases itself out of Utah. They use the name Jesus Christ all the time, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. They distort. There's so many different voices to distort. They pervert truths. I'll give you two specific areas where even in quote-unquote Christianity, truth has been distorted. And those two particular areas are on two things that we practiced here, and I do believe we should practice them, but they're very much distorted as it relates to salvation, and they are baptism and communion. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some groups, the way they word their creeds, I'm not talking about Roman Catholicism particularly, I'm speaking of Protestant groups, the way they word their creeds, the way they teach their things, people come away, even if in their core beliefs, when you really press them, they say, salvation is by grace, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Why do you have the verbiage and the wording like you have it regarding baptism and communion. Why do you say baptism puts you into the family of God? That's a no-no if you know anything about the gospel. Baptism puts you into the water. Well, we got some people we're going to baptize hopefully in a month or so, a few weeks. Um, but that's what it does. It puts you in the water. It identifies you with Jesus Christ. It shows that your old life is dead and buried. Now you're risen to walk in newness of life. It's a figure of your salvation. It shows what happened in Christ. But to use that particular phrase, those phrases, that's why people come away with the idea, well, I've got to be baptized to go to heaven. I can't tell you how many times I've asked people, are you saved? They say, yeah, I've been baptized. That ain't what I ask you. 
I ask you, are you saved? The reason they think that is because their churches and the way they've worded things all through the years, and really you can go all the way back to the Reformation for this. You can blame the Protestant Reformation for this if you'd like to because they didn't come out of Rome like they should have come out of Rome. And they have this verbiage. The same thing with the Lord's Supper. They think because they take of those elements now that they are receiving Christ by receiving the bread and the juice. And the Bible speaks of the memorial of Christ's Supper as that, a memorial. We're looking back and saying Jesus sat down with his disciples. They drank the juice and they ate the bread because the juice represents his blood and the bread represents his body. But eating the juice and drinking, eating the bread and drinking the juice does not get you into heaven any more than coming to church gets you to heaven. And so it's partial truths and then it's perverted truths. Acts 16.31, the question is asked, what must I do to be saved? The answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If the answer was communion or baptism, they would have said, be baptized or take communion. They didn't say either of those. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. So you'll see from verse number 7, he talks about perverting the gospel. A false gospel distorts the gospel. So many voices. It's kind of like your windshield. If you don't have a good wax on it or you don't put rain -X on it, and if you don't have windshield wipers especially, you just can't see out it clearly. And there's people in church this morning looking for the truth, and they're getting all these other things. And they'll put discipleship where salvation should go. You know what? You ought to be reading your Bible every day, but you can read your Bible every day, every day and go to hell. Reading your Bible every day is not going to take you to heaven. Coming into church every Sunday is not going to take you into heaven. There are some things that are good to do as far as discipleship goes. And Jesus said, you want to follow me? You've got to forsake everything. Yeah, that's, that's discipleship. The disciples were called Christians. You want to be a Christian? There's some things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to deny yourself and say, you know what, I'm going to make the time to pray. I'm going to make the time to read my Bible. I'm going to make the time to tell someone about Jesus. I'm going to make the time to attend service. That's what a disciple, a disciple does. Uh, these athletes, you see them around town. Not today, they're getting rained out. They're wearing the little Speedos, riding the little bicycles. And uh, they're very religious on Sunday morning. And those golfers up there on the golf course are very religious on Sunday morning. Man, they're hitting the golf ball before I'm in church. Very disciplined in what they want to do. It's sad that someone who is saved can't be disciplined. But don't mistake your discipleship and the things that you do for your salvation. You're not saved by your works, and you're not kept by your works. And that leads me really to the second thing. The false gospel deceives because it puts that false truth in there, and people get this idea that they have to do something to get saved or do something to stay saved. Now, here's where the book of Galatians finds application with all of us. Galatians is not just written to unsaved people to try to straighten them out on salvation. Galatians is also written to save people. I think I preached out of it or kind of used it as a spring. Wednesday night, um, he said, you did run well. Who did hinder you? In Galatians chapter 5, that you should obey the truth. In other words, he's writing to some believers at Galatia. That was a province, an area there. He's writing to some believers there that started off well. They did trust Christ. But then they fell back under Judaism because of these Pharisee converted Pharisees that still taught that you still had to do all these rituals and regulations and rules. So they began, even though they've begun with Christ and they've begun in grace, they got tricked into this thing thinking that they were going to have to keep doing these things in order to stay saved. Now if you know church history, I've mentioned some things about Protestants. You're probably are familiar with John Wesley, which he came out of the Anglican church. Really, kind of like Martin Luther, never would have came out unless he got forced out. But in him and George Whitfield, both good, good Anglicans. But they, uh, John Wesley believed in the idea that you had to keep doing certain things or you could lose your salvation. In other words, you could fall out of the grace of Christ. And consequently, there's a lot of people 
that they don't fully comprehend what Jesus Christ did on the Calvary's cross. So they, even though they may put their faith for salvation, they get confused and they get brought into this. I'm not saying that everybody who is brought into that type of teaching is lost. Don't misquote me here. I believe people get saved, but they get led astray in false doctrine. That happens. Here's the danger. You start off well, you know you're saved by God's grace, but then you begin, instead of looking at Christ and what He accomplished on Calvary for your standing in Christ and what Christ accomplished for you on Calvary to be accepted in the Beloved. The reason God accepts me and you is because of Jesus. We start looking at ourselves. And now we've got to measure ourselves among ourselves. Now we have to compare ourselves. Now we have to see what we're doing. And now it becomes all about a religion instead of a relationship. You want to be real careful with that. Because you can be deceived. You can be real busy like Martha and not be worshiping God like Mary. Well, I'm in church. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Yeah, you have some works. But are you walking by faith? He says, as ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. When you got saved, you got saved by grace through faith. That's how you're supposed to walk. We get saved by faith, and then we want to live by works. We, we, we use the book of James to justify it. Well, you know, you've got to have faith without works. Faith without works is dead, so I have one or is faith, and the other or is works. The problem with that, if you keep pushing that theology, and I'm not saying you don't use that practically speaking to say, hey, there is uh, uh, something that you can say, look, there's nothing on record to prove that I'm saved. There's a problem. If everybody who knows you, the first thing they think about you is all these other things besides you being saved, you need to be looking at yourself. I'm not saying to throw that out the window. However, when all you do is try to justify your faith by your works, there's a problem. You're not looking at Jesus anymore. You're looking at yourself. You follow me? false gospel deceives. A false gospel to an unsaved person sounds like this. You can clean up. You can reform your life. You're just as good as that person. That person claims to be a Christian. You live just as decent as them. It sounds good. It sounds like it's something that you can do. A false gospel teaches a works-based salvation. That's a false gospel. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So a false-based gospel will teach that you have to do something in order to attain. You have to do something in order to get forgiven. Whereas the grace of Christ says there's nothing you can do. Jesus has already paid it all. You have to receive the gift of God. That's God's grace. Think of it like this with Cain and Abel. Here's Cain and Abel. First twins on the earth. Um, Cain and Abel going along pretty good there. And they learned some things, I think, from Adam and Eve. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they made fig leaves. They went into the, uh, the Hanes underwear market uh, real early. I don't even know if they have Hanes or Fruit of the Looms or whatever it was. Fig, fig, fig treat, Fruit of the Looms. And they started making their underwear, and they found out that fig leaves don't last too well. And they probably uh, scratch you all up too, so that's probably a bad thing. Uh, fig leaves didn't work too well, and God saw them, and they were running from God and hiding from God or behind the fig leaves. And by the way, fig trees in the Bible represent the nation of Israel. The Bible says Israel... They did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They tried to establish their own righteousness. So it represents self-righteousness. Look, God, I don't need you. I can cover up myself. God said, that ain't going to work. So God killed probably a lamb. The Bible says it was an animal. He made skins and he covered Adam and Eve. And I believe they passed that down because Abel, whenever he wanted to approach God, he brought a lamb and he killed the lamb and put it on the altar because that lamb had to die and the blood had to be shed for God to be able to fellowship with Abel. And Cain said, I don't like that. I'm going to bring what I've done. And he got all the fruits, got all of his turnips out of his garden. He started cutting those turnips up. Of course, you know you can't get blood from the turnip. 
That's where that saying comes from. And God was not pleased with his offering. He told him, he says, look, why don't you just go talk to Abel? I'm sure Abel would give you a lamb. But instead of submitting himself to God's word and doing what God said to do to find forgiveness, he instead killed his own brother. Two religions. One says, I can't do it myself. I have to bring what God has provided, which is this lamb. Blood is shed in my behalf. The other religion says, I'm going to do it on my own. A religion that says, I have to do something. And then a religion that says, it's already been done for you. You have two religions, works or grace. The true gospel of the grace of God teaches that Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty for you. Now, I've already mentioned this, but I'll kind of finish up verses 6 through 8 with this. A false gospel diverts people. It diverts them down a the wrong road. People that aren't saved when they hear this, and let me just make mention, and, and I'm not going to name names. You can go look them all up. Like I said, we don't have time to be polemic and try to just blast people and try to give you stats and all that. It's really a waste of time anyway. But it is embarrassing to see some of the figures of some of the money that some of these preachers income, what they're pulling in. It's unbelievable. And these are people that, people that don't know better, they just flip on the TV and they just, or TV or internet or whatever it is, and they're thinking, oh, here's a guy that's got 45,000 people listening to him. I wouldn't trust that guy with my dog. I'm not giving you a name. You can just fill in the blanks. I'm just being honest with you. I don't trust him. That many people standing in front of you and you cannot tell them how to avoid hell and how to go to heaven. That many people standing in front of you and you have a Bible, you're supposedly called to preach and you can't lift up your voice and glorify Jesus Christ and magnify the cross and tell people that the blood of Jesus Christ will save, that if they trust their own righteousness, they'll die and go to hell. You can't do that. 45,000 people on a Sunday morning. I have more respect for the worst politician than for that guy. It deceives, it diverts, and it damns people. They watch these people, and, and I guarantee you, just a few, just because of, you know, just like us, if you say, hey, I want to get a tennis shoe, immediately there's a name brand that's going to pop into your head just because it's been plastered all over the place. Somebody without hope, without God, they say, hey, I want to find God. Hey, uh, they, and in, in their mind, just because they've seen the name, or they type it in the computer, or they look at it on the TV, they think, oh, this is Christianity. Let me see what he says. He gets up there and says, you know what? God loves you, and God loves them, and God loves this, and there's no preaching on sin. And by the way, if you don't know you're a sinner, why do you need a Savior? Why all this stuff about blood and the cross and judgment and Jesus having to die? When Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where's your God of love right there? I'm talking about a God who would take an innocent man, let him be betrayed, and let him hang on a cross, and then forsake him for three hours. And let him die. That's your God of love? You're only getting one side of the coin. God does not tolerate sin. He never has and He never will. And by the way, God's not going to apologize for offending you. And I know we're dealing with a thin-skinned generation today. Some of you probably don't like the way I'm talking down to you. I'm not talking down to you. I'm just preaching the Bible. Some of you ain't heard preaching in so long, you don't, you, you don't know how to react to it. Why is He raising His voice? What do you want me to do, talk to you like this? I just love you, and I'm so glad that you're in church. Don't we love one another? I'm just so thankful that we're here today and we can all pray for one another. And we know that God loves all denominations. He loves you no matter your gender. He loves you no matter your choices. God is just going to put up with you and, and God loves everybody. I'm getting a little nauseous here. You go in the average churches, and that's the kind of stuff you're getting. I'm not worried about offending you. You get mad, I'm sorry, but I want you to get the truth. You say, well, the truth is kind of hard to swallow. Well, put a little sugar with it. Here's the sugar. You look very nice this morning. You dressed up nice. You look good. 
Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm sure you're very intelligent. You're smart. Uh, there, there's your sugar. Now take the rest of it. Take your medicine and apply it. Amen. I think in this age there might be a little undercurrent of some people that do want to hear the truth over the plate waist high. When you go to the doctor, you, want him, you don't want him to say, well, you know what, you're just really healthy and you're only 500 pounds overweight, but, you know, we really know that you, you, got, you got your diet under control and we know that you've got this under control. You haven't been taking your medicine, but I'm not going to get on to you because I don't want to talk down to you. And I just want you to like me before you leave because I really don't have that many patients and I want to keep all the one. No. He's going to say, hey, this is, this is what the record shows right here. The record shows you got a problem, and if you don't get some help for this problem, we're going to be burying you. Uh, this record right here shows that you have a problem, and if you don't get some help for your sin problem, not only are we going to bury you, but you're going to wind up in the wrong place. So how do you spell that? H-E-L-L. It's not Hades like in the NIV. It's H-E-L-L like hell. If you do not get saved, you will burn in a place the Bible describes as hell. Amen. So I don't like that. Well, that's good. Because if you don't like that, that means you know that you don't want to go there. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is very positive. The other side of the coin is the gospel. I started out by saying gospel means glad tidings or good news. And the good news is you don't have to go to hell. Nobody has to go to hell. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. He's already made the way clear. And it's a grace-paved highway. God's grace. There's nothing you do. You receive Christ. That's it. You trust him. You probably heard the story of the fire. There was a fire, and the, the dad got out, and his son was stuck up in this second story there. There's a little boy, and the smoke is billowing out, coming everywhere. And the boy opens the window, and, he, and, he, and his dad's yelling, Hey, jump, jump, jump. I'll catch you. He's like, Dad, I can't see you. I can't see you. He says, That's okay, as long as I can see you. So, preacher, I don't have it all figured out. I've got to learn to understand the mysteries. I've got to figure out the Trinity. You're going to get your figuring machine, you'll never be able to figure out the Trinity. Well, I need to figure out the virgin birth. You're never going to be able to figure out the... I need to figure out what Jesus did, and I need to figure out all these supposed contradictions. There are no contradictions in the Bible. The problem's not the Bible, the problem's us. You can't figure everything out. You think you live in the day of knowledge, but in the day of knowledge, we have all these facts that are conflicting. We're living in a time where we're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You need to put your figuring down and pick up faith. And say, okay, as long as he can see me, I believe what he said. You believe there's a God? Okay, that's a great start. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Hebrews 11. You believe there's a God? Okay, God loved you enough to send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you. He lived the sinless life you couldn't live. He, he died the death that you deserve. He rose again from the dead. He's alive. He'll save you if you ask him. He can see you. You ain't got to have everything else figured out. You got all these clouds, all these diversions, all this deception, all these other voices. Jesus Christ died for you. You've got to take him. You've got to trust him. He's the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. This isn't a decision that your mama's got to make, your granddaddy's got to make for you, your aunt's got to make for you. You have to make this decision yourself. Another gospel, a false gospel, diverts and it damns people. Destruction. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Paul has some pretty strong words in verses 8 and 9. He says, if anybody's preaching anything else, let them be accursed. And the reason that is is because someone who believes this, they're not saved. Someone who teaches that you have to do things in order to get to heaven or their own trust in their own self-righteousness, they are lost. So that's a bad place to be at. That's a bad gospel. That's a gospel to avoid altogether. And so he says, if anybody preaches anything else, let it be accursed. The gospel 
that we preach is the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what you need to believe. If you don't believe it, you say, well, how do I know for sure? The Bible says it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know the sad thing? The Bible says salvation is unto all, but upon all them that believe. It's for everybody. People say, well, you know, you, you're so exclusive. You're saying Jesus is the only way. You're excluding all these other root groups. Yes and no. Yes in the sense of there's only one exit door. But anybody can go out of that exit door. Any Muslim or Buddhist or Catholic or Protestant or, or atheist, anybody can come to Jesus. After they come to Jesus, they won't be a Baptist, Catholic, Methodist. They'll be a believer. What are you? Are you a Baptist? Oh, no, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ first. I'm a Baptist next, and then I'm American. I'm an American last. Right? That's a probably pretty good order. I'm a Baptist before I'm an American. Amen. But I'm a Christian. I'm a believer before I'm a Baptist. That's the priority there. So, yeah, it's exclusive. Jesus is the only way, but God's love says it's for everybody. I quoted the verse in Timothy, God who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. There was a man years ago back in the 30s, he was convicted of murder, and he served out his sentence. And he was serving out his sentence, rather. And he served out 20 years already, and he was out at a farm camp working. And after those 20 years, the parole officer people had then got to work, and they had actually got a release for him. So he didn't have to serve that last 10 years. Of course, that's back in the day when you didn't have all the, the communication like you had, and they had this letter of often, an authentic letter of certifying his release that was sent to him, but the letter got lost. The man served out 10 years even though he was a free man the whole time. Come to find out after he'd already gotten out and they had already... Well, by the time they started digging back in the paperwork, they realized, oh, that letter never made it out to the camp. He served out 10 years that he didn't have to. The tragedy, I've said this a million times, the tragedy of someone dying and going to hell is that they didn't have to go there. Jesus died for whatever horrible sin you've ever committed. He paid the price for it. There's not a sin bad enough that you can think of that Jesus Christ did not die for he loved you so much, and God thought so much of you that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be that perfect sacrifice. And all of your sin and my sin was placed on him. And he paid the penalty for it. And consequently, if you'll trust him, he will, God will forgive you of all your sins. Because the reason he's able to do that is because he'll take the record of Christ, the sinless, spotless life that Christ lived, and he'll put that on your account. And so when God pulls up your record, he sees the life of Christ. He doesn't see all your sins. It's called We call it substitution, somebody taking the place for you. The tragedy of people dying without Christ and going to hell is that they don't have to. If you're here under the sound of my voice and you don't know for sure that you're saved, we're going to give you an opportunity to trust Christ as your personal Savior this morning, right now. Our pianist is going to come and play us an invitational hymn. We're not asking you to join the church. We're not asking you to get baptized. We're not asking you to do any religious ritual. The invitation is simply an invitation, an invite for you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's all.